is the thing, you know, you, you, uh, <laughs> you think about it, you know, here is this uh, rhetoric, you know, this uh, tsunami of uh, rhetoric uh, of crisis in education, cost, quality, and, you know, that's what I hear on the one side. And on the other side, you know, I hear this other cacophony of technologies, products, services, goods, and, uh, uh, you know, pronouncements, publications, you know, and I slipped mine in there, you know, for shameless self-promotion. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's uh, Clayton Christensen who writes about, uh, uh, you know, disruption, the necessity for disruption, uh, you know, the crisis scenario. Uh, there are folks like me who are actually optimistic who pull people together and ask them to talk about uh, opportunities of technology and open presence. You know. So the question is, is there a crisis? And uh, I say, well, there is. You know, there's lots of this stuff going on, but there are still too many on the outside looking in. Too, too many on the outside looking in. So I did a lot of work in India. And, you know, you hear about open technology and so on. You know. And w one of the things that happened in India was some years ago, uh, there was this, uh, uh, what, what they call uh, the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, which is universal primary education. You know. So this is a wonderful thing, you know, the fact that you know, primary education for all was made free and available, but it had its problems. It poured out a lot, lots of children, and there was no place to go because the secondary education system did not have the capacity to take them in. Those are the kids that you see. So you could not build a school a week, a traditional school, bricks and mortar a week, in order to, take, uh, in order to meet the demand. You know? So they fall through the cracks. So is there a crisis? Yes, there is. There are issues. There are issues of access. Uh, in this country, you know, the, we read this in the popular media. You hear about it from people like Chris. The cost of education, the prohibitive cost of education. You know, I heard this wonderful thing about... Uh, this is a sort of an ancillary thing. A uh, couple of, well, I shouldn't say it's wonderful, but it was certainly stark uh, that uh, this past year was called the one T year because student loan debt was one trillion dollars. You know, this is students who take loan for higher education. So yes, uh, you know, there is there is crisis, uh, there is cost over here, and then I mean there is a crisis or there are difficulties, and I call them demand side factors, which manifest themselves differently. Uh, for instance, in terms of the fact that we have a whole new set of uh, learners, you know, coming with differentiated preparations, who come with a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, all the stuff about digital natives who come up with different kinds of technology savvy, and the fact just that through integration of digitization, lots of domains of knowledge are changing. In fact, I'll talk about that in some, you know, in some time. So there are lots of stuff that go in this crisis uh, or difficulty, obstacle, demand bucket. Uh, so. Uh, uh, are there any answers? And, uh, you know, what you saw just now is this progression. About uh, 10 years ago, MIT cast a pebble into this tranquil, I should say, complacent uh, educational universe. Uh, the, the ripples that came out of there formed waves, and they became an ocean like that. If you haven't guessed already, I'm talking about what happened with OpenCourseWare. OpenCourseWare was launched. Following it quickly, uh, there were all these other institutions. The open course for itself was phenomenal. The fact that there were, you know, there are right now about 2,100 courses, uh, you know, 13,000 lectures, which translates to 13,000 lectures, video lectures, assignments, assessments, and so on. But what followed was upwards of 250 institutions who formed the consortium. What followed then, or what you're seeing now, you know, uh, uh, Eric Grimson, the chancellor, when he, when he talked about EDX, the fact that there are these MOOCs which have been launched, so uh, which have not just courses, but you have a course with 120,000 students who registered, uh, all kinds of Khan Academy, all kinds of open educational resources, courses, content, which are being available not just for formal, but for also for non-traditional education, for self-learning opportunities. So there is something that's going on in the supply side, in the let's take comfort side also. So uh, this is what, when I, when I characterize what's going on, uh, I'll, pick a, I'll pick a favorite term of mine, which Lev referred to also, the term abundance. You know? So we do have abundance expressed through this phenomenon, through this confluence, through this intersection of technology, 
technology again writ large, technology defined generously, the devices, the software, the architecture, the services, the processes, the confluence of that, the intersection with that, with all the stuff that we call open, open content, open resources, open legal policies, and that intersection is providing a lot of abundance, abundant content, abundant learning opportunities, flexible learning, anytime learning, anywhere learning, which are redefining what people learn, how people learn, where people learn, right? What's it's besides content, it's also pointing to a whole bunch of communities. There's a very interesting thing. Uh, our colleague Anant Agarwal, when he launched uh, EDX, so, you know, when, it, when the first MITx course was launched, uh, you know, there was Anant and two other faculty members, uh, Jerry Sussman and Chris Terman, some TAs, three TAs, and 120,000 students registered, and they said, whoa, you know, this is a lot. I mean, this defeats any kind of good student ratio that we thought about, right? What they did not anticipate is it was not Anant and Anant and his two colleagues in the three tiers who were now facing the prospect of having to teach 120,000 students, but the fact that communities were forming, self-organized communities who are working with each other to learn from each other, who are doing a lot of the facilitative aspects that you expect to be happening in a class. That was what was going on. And we know this, the social networks that are happening, the peer-to-peer, -peer, including universities that are happening. So what's really happening is you have an abundance of communities. There is another aspect of abundance, and you know, Lev talked wonderfully about some of the other dimensions of, of uh, uh, abundance in the first day. There is one thing uh, that we talk about a lot. I know certainly Phil, Phil Long over there, who talks about a lot about the abundance of data. Suddenly there is data, data from the LMSs, data that's coming on, data that helps us with analytics to determine much more acutely what kinds of interventions we want to provide, how to personalize learning in different ways. In fact, I have always, and maybe I'll talk Larry into this, wanted to do a seminar on how to think about pedagogical transformation in the face of abundant data. One of the things that we forget, when we learned a lot of stuff was done by induction, you know, rules-based stuff. You know. And suddenly we have this data facing us, but a lot of stuff is done through patterns. You know, translation is to be very rules-based. Now much of it is statistically based in the first pass, and then you do the nuancing, the fine-tuning uh, through, uh, through rules-based stuff. So there's a lot of stuff. How are we thinking about re-engineering our pedagogy, given that there's just this data, uh, tremendous amounts of data. We have a colleague of ours, Ian Hunter, uh, who, when you walk into his room, you know, he has sensors that are capturing data from the moment you walk into the room. You know. There's all that data and he uses it for analysis. So there's data and we really have to think about how we think about transforming our pedagogy through the data. So, network, open, abundance, but abundance in these kinds of things that we had not thought about. Uh, some of the things that it enables, which are much more personal. So this is us about uh, two months ago, we were in Haiti. Uh, Lourdes, who's the person with the glasses, who's teaching. So we uh, worked with educators in Haiti to talk about active learning in physics, in biology, using open resources, open technology. And now we're able to do that with this whole scaffolding that's available to us. So that's the advantage. That's where I see the opportunity. Here's this. There's uh, Cite Soleil, who looked at stuff from open courseware and he's directly translating it to something that he needs. He's building, uh, as you see, uh, solar panels which are electrifying, which are powering street lights in Haiti. So there are these kinds of very, very real things, learning opportunities, if you will, that are being enabled by this abundance, this is dimension of openness. Now, when we talk about open, we typically think about content. <clears throat> uh, you know, we, talk, we talked about communities, and we say, well, as educators, well, what all this interaction, you know? How am I going to do labs? How am I going to do experiments? By the way, these are experiments, interactive experiences that are being done uh, on MITx. This is for the circuit scores where people are able to, you know, uh, plug in values, do the experiments interactively. Uh, here is something that we are very proud of. These are star simulations. So these are for visualizing molecules. They're intended to bring the practice, the tools, the excitement of research uh, into education. And this is done by our office, OEIT. And uh, the interesting thing about this is, this is being used by middle school students. And what do they do? They're able to grab a DNA molecule, visualize it, make comparisons, make calculations on it, 
They're able to reach into Cornell's open database, grab a DNA, uh, make comparisons, speculations. So it's that kind of powerful experiences that are being enabled through this confluence of openness and technology. By the way, all the star resources are available openly that you can look at. So we have not just content, but the possibility, the prospect of end-to-end -end real educational experiences that are possible. And not to sound like your favorite TV salesman, but wait, wait, there's more. There's iLab, right? Some of you have heard about iLabs. So the gentleman in the center, Jesus Dialamos, uh, whose brainchild this is, and this is about making real labs accessible over the internet. Not simulations, not visualizations, but browser-based access to real labs. That's network analyzer equipment. We have students from Singapore, from Sweden, from Cambridge, from Sub-Saharan Africa, who are able to uh, do these experiments using browsers, have access to real instrumentation. Now, we saw an extreme version of that in Les' presentation when he was talking about the telesurgery. Now, the thing is, the iLabs is not about expensive instruments and having access to expensive, but the fact that you can make laboratory experiences easily available from anywhere to anywhere. So the from anywhere to anywhere is important because the open architecture of iLab is not is to make sure that these are, the story that I'm telling is not about five labs in MIT, which are accessible, but that f folks anywhere can create labs and make it accessible anywhere. In fact, I would suspect there are more open iLabs from Queensland, from my colleague, uh, Phil Long's place and from China than there are at MIT. So that's the case and the fact that you can really have this, I mean, uh, his byline that really stuck with us, if you can't come to the lab, the lab will come to you. Those are the possibilities over here. So imagine this. This is my perspective, prospective, if you will. You know. Think about iLabs, think about Fab Labs, think about the visualizations, the simulations, and think about this rich ecosystem of first-hand experiences that you can provide to the world. Now, that is the kind of educational possibility that I envision that can happen, that open and technology bring. And, I, and looking at all these experiments, it's quite conceivable that this is not in the realm of my rash optimism as it is, but in terms, of, this, is pretty, this is pretty real and pretty now. Uh, things like this are possible. So let me switch to a little place. Uh, I was very really struck by Don Henderson's uh, presentation uh, on challenge-based learning. We've been talking a lot about challenge-based learning. I said, okay, let me, let me share some of the challenge-based stuff that we do. These are students at MIT. Uh, this is a solar car uh, you know, competition that they build. What's happening nowadays is this is an international competition with teams that are distributed across the world who are actually doing a lot of the design and, the, and almost up to the fabrication online. I mean, I was just imagining listening to Sherry yesterday that the next version of this would be a fab lab exercise. Now, uh, so there's that, but there's also stuff like this that our students are doing who go and solve real enduring challenging problems. You know, one of the things that I was looking for in the categorization of uh, stuff in the preceding uh, presentation was something that was said about relevance. You know? And these are the kinds of activities that make our engineering and science education relevant. So we have students who go and build these rickshaw-based ambulances. In fact, the previous slide was the planning and design aspect, and these are being built, WHO has bought them. Now, what is interesting about them is not the largest, you know, the, uh, the philanthropic aspect of it or this gesture towards humanity, and this, which is all very, very important. A lot of students look for that, but the fact that these speak to real engineering problems. So when you build that rickshaw as an ambulance, it's not just a matter of attaching four wheels or three, in some cases two, to the thing this can carry around. But the fact that you're going to lock patients, which means it has to be dampened, it means it has to be moved bidirectionally very, very with great facility. So it brings in lots of complexity to learn about engineering and science, you know, but you're doing it for a worthy cause. Now imagine this. Imagine what Open could do with this. We had a wonderful conversation with Tom Khalil a couple of months ago talking about what are the possibilities. You know, what openness could do over here is, is uh, maybe have people share ideas, have built from these, build on these. So this, these are the kinds of, from first-time experience to experiential learning possibilities that we can enable. So I'm pretty up on all this. These are the slides. The one thing that I'll say in closing over here 
is when we think about all these possibilities, it's all right to imagine this, but it takes time. What we are really saying that in order for any of these visions and perspectives to be realized, we really have to have an orientation towards innovation. Big word. What I'm really saying is that we have to be open to failure, that we have to have a perspective that is long, that is, that is long term for all the reasons that Chris was pointing out, the fact that you have to layer education and stuff, but it takes time, it takes sustained commitment, it takes sustained inv investment, but we have to stay with it because we believe it's worth it. And as my colleague Molly, who wrote this wonderful piece on Astra, is it worth it? Way out there is a world of might, waiting to open, waiting to find, a way to make a bridge across the universe of knowledge that's there to share if we dare. Every seed can grow another seed to blossom. What we do can make this happen. What we say has an echo, 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 echo. Do we dare to share? So, uh, to pick up a line uh, from Chuck West and before that from T.S. Eliot, do we dare to disturb the educational universe? Do we dare? Sure we did. Thank you. That's all I have.